This is our take two of our Australia Travel Hangout. I'm Ron Motter and chatting with good friend Rhonda Green there in Queensland, Australia. Ah, it's after 4.30 in the afternoon here in Las Vegas. What time is it there in Bris Vegas? Twin, uh, 10.30 a.m. So, oh. and, it's, uh, and it's been pretty hot. Hot? How hot this is, is it been? Not, 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 not too bad today. Ron Motter and chatting with the friend Alan. We're getting some backup, and I bet that's South Australia. Uh, it's after 4.30 in the afternoon here in Las Vegas. Oh, that's just so lovely. So you were you were telling me extolling the temperatures there in Queensland. How hot is it? Well, it's it's okay today, but it's been up to 40 in the last couple of days. 40 centigrade. I hear that's the 40 ideal. 40 Celsius. I hear that's it's the over your 100. I hear that's the ideal temperature for a tennis tournament. Whoa! <laughs> I don't think I'd like to try it. All right, tell us what what sort of weather should we expect on the east coast of Australia? particularly in Sydney in November 2014. Oh, should be getting pretty warm. They sometimes have some pretty spectacular thunderstorms at night. But yeah, it should be usually pretty pleasant. It should be just really nicely warm in November. And um, yeah, Sydney is sort of between the Mediterranean climate and the subtropical climate. And, you know, subtropical up here we get our, our rainfall in summer. Down south, we get rainfall in winter, but I think Sydney's a bit less predictable. I but agree. yeah, it should be nice, pleasant weather, and it'll be springtime. It'll be your fall, but it'll be springtime there, and so a lot of the birds will be mating and calling, and a lot of flowers will be uh, native. Uh, native flowers will be blooming. So yeah, it should be pretty nice. What? Uh we should take a couple steps back. Uh, we've known each other for nearly 20 years, ever since I had a gopher. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. um, uh, can you tell us a, a little bit about your background and your work with wildlife and tourism? Okay. Well, I actually started um, back in the 60s. When I left school, I started a holiday farm and uh, running nature studies and horsemanship and hikes. Um, mostly for children, but for adults as well. Then I went to uni, got a PhD in zoology, and um, kept on running a few things, uh, a few excursions from time to time on a voluntary basis. And uh, now I'm, I'm still an adjunct research fellow at Griffith University. Don't do much lecturing nowadays, don't have time, but I've been running my ecotourism business since 1997, Arakaria Eco Tours, specializing in wildlife tours, bird watching, looking for kangaroos and platypus and so on, and um, especially giving people a quick overview of what makes Australia so different from the rest of the world. Why are we so different? What is so different? And um, about 12 years ago, I've, um, Wildlife Tourism Australia started. I was at the conference in Tasmania. I was already working, doing research for the CRC for Sustainable Tourism. Uh, oh, it's just started raining. <laughs> uh, you might hear that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and um, I became vice chair of Wildlife Tourism Australia. And I think two years ago, I became chair. Of Wildlife Tourism Australia. That's a national body that that um, stands for supporting um, sustainable, uh, a diverse, sustainable wildlife tourism industry, which in turn supports conservation. So uh, yeah, we're into uh, our members. Are, uh, no. Um, well, they're tour operators, eco lodges, sound, you know, uh, conservation, environmentally sound tourism, and good quality interpretation. All right, okay. now let me ask you. Uh, we've, ask we've run a number of workshops. Now, how many members does Wildlife Tourism Australia have? Um, 
It's a bit low at the moment. I think about 70 at the moment. We're hoping to double and tr double or triple that by uh, the end of the year. Okay. We went through a bit of a black spot a few years ago, and we're building up again. Well, as we say, no one wants to join a club that would have them as a member. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this: in terms of the members, we are right. Of in terms of the members of Wildlife Tourism Australia. What percentage work in national or state parks? I'd say a, a lot of them. Um, I don't know, just off the top of my head, probably 60, 70 percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because a lot of them are either eco lodges close to a national park or they are operators who would. Um, who would take tours into national parks. There'd also be a couple of researchers who go into national parks. I think you say a pretty pretty high percentage. A pretty high percentage, yes. Now again... Uh, uh, that, 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 that would include some marine parks, not just terrestrial parks, but yeah, there'd be terrestrial parks all over Australia and also some marine parks, especially Great Barrier Reef. Understood. Uh, for for a newcomer, for a visitor to Australia, what should we know about uh, the setup of national and state parks? Does is does Parks Australia uh, have management over all of the parks, or do states have different have uh, different guidelines and protocols? And again, you know, sp speak for the beginner. What should we know about how okay. Australia manages the parks? Yeah. Well. National parks is a bit of a misnomer in Australia because our states manage them, our states and territories. Like Kakadu National Park is managed by the Northern Territory. Um, Lamington National Park is managed by Queensland government, etc. And um, in fact, even the even the power of the federal government to control environmental matters generally is being um, given more to the states now. So, yeah, uh, they really should be called state parks. But I wish we had some of the uh, the biggest and more important ones that really, really were national parks in the sense that um, American national parks are really national. We don't seem to have any of those. But this is why Tourism Australia started um, developing national landscapes because I think we have something like 300 national parks scattered around Australia and it's a little bit hard to promote those so Tourism Australia when it's promoting the natural areas of Australia now promote what they call na national landscapes there's something like 16 of those so far like one of them is in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales which for some strange reason they called um, Australia's green cauldron which makes me think of Macbeth's Three Witches. It's referring to the um, the very well-preserved caldera of a 23 uh, million year old volcano, which is which was a cauldron. It was a very fiery place 23 million years ago, um, but is now covered in lush green rainforest. And it's also supposed to imply a melting pot. But anyway, that includes the Lamington National Park of Queensland, the Border Ranges National Park in New South Wales, which are two very large parks which adjoin each other, and then a few smaller parks like the Mount Warning National Park, which is the volcano at the, at the old uh, cone at the centre of the crater at the caldera, and then a few other small national parks around that, like Mount Tambourine, Mount Barney and a few others. So, um, and then we've got the top end, we've got the Red Centre, we've got um, the Great Ocean Road, which includes Otway Ranges, which I think is a national park. So, yeah, most of these national landscapes include at least one and sometimes a dozen or more national parks. I hear you. And that, you're saying that's being promoted by Tourism Australia. That's right, yeah with input from Parks Australia or with input from the various state stakeholders? Uh, inputs from a number of people, yeah. They, they, um, they hold 
um, they hold workshops every now and then. I've been to a few of them. And, um, yeah, and input from, well, from us, Wildlife Tourism Australia, and from Ecotourism Australia, and from various local committees. Like, I think Jonathan Fisher, the CEO of Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary, is, uh, well, he is or was the head of the local committee for the Green Cauldron National Landscape. Okay, and our, our mutual friend... Yeah, like, but um, it's mostly tourism. Our mutual friend Joanne Palmer, she's with that big volcano there you were talking about in the middle of the cauldron? Yes. Yes, that's right. And and uh, we were hoping to get her on board today, but she still has no webcam, so hopefully we'll get her on board. All right, okay. Hopefully next we'll get time. her on next time. I mean, my thinking is this. If Australia is hosting this, you know, once every decade, World Parks Congress, it, it makes all the sense in the world that we learn about uh, the parks in Australia. And yeah. I'm going to ask some very simple questions. Uh, again, you know, what, uh, one, you know, is there an easy way for us to know about the park structures and how the parks in Western Australia are similar or different than what you have in Queensland? Or... Well, it, it, yeah, um, I can find out some more information for next time, but basically each state has its environment department. They keep changing their names. Ours has been through so many name changes, it's hard to keep up with it. And uh, when they do change, sometimes people have to reapply for the jobs they had, and then they get different jobs to what they meant to apply for. It's a bit of a mess sometimes. But each state does have its environment department. But this time, with our latest change of government in Queensland, environment went into one portfolio and national parks into another, which has confused a lot of people. Some of the original staff for a while didn't know which department they were working for. So some of it is, I'm afraid, a bit of a mess. But I'll, I'll find out as much as I can about that and uh, let you know next time. What about environmental conservation groups? Uh, who are the leaders in, in protecting the parks and protected areas? Oh, well, yeah, we, um, we have the Australian Conservation Foundation, which stands for all of Australia. The Wilderness Society, which again is Australia-wide. Uh, then we have various state ones. Like um, actually, there is National Parks Australia, which is wide. I think, uh, but then we have um, Queensland Conservation Council. Um, yeah, we have various. Again, I can get a whole list for you and let you know them all next time and um, put up some URLs. That'd be but yeah, there's a lot of conservation societies. And I'm uh, I'm now on the committee also of a um, so far just Queensland, but to spread to the rest, an alliance of conservation associations called Protect the Bush Alliance, and uh, um, within that, the National Parks Association is a member, Wildlife Tourism Australia is a member, BirdLife Australia, Wildlife Queensland. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of members within the Alliance, so that we, um, yeah, all these different organisations can network better and discuss various conservation issues. Okay. And we actually meet in the National Parks Association office. Now, from, from your viewpoint, have you heard very much about this World Parks Congress in November? Not as much as I'd like. I am on their um, email list, and I hear a little bit from time to time. But um, and of course, I guess I've been pretty busy with other things, uh, leading tours, writing books, doing research, um, a whole lot, uh, going to other meetings, and so on. So maybe I haven't pursued it as much as I could have. But um, I certainly intend representing Wildlife Tourism Australia at the congress. And Wildlife Tourism Australia is also organising a one-day workshop in Sydney the day before the Congress starts. 
we may end up holding it in the uh, Botanic Gardens. I'd like to hold it somewhere nice, not just um, you know, in a hotel or something. I despise all of those ecotourism meetings held behind the air-conditioned walls. <laughs> yeah. I think I upset people at, upset people at one ecotourism conference by um, asking, um, yeah, what do you really what what do you really mean by an eco a, accredited eco tour, um, an accredited eco tourism operation should be primarily in the um, natural habitats, and I pointed outside and said, you know. Uh, if we go out there, we'll be in a natural habitat. Where we are right now, we're not. But apparently I upset the manager because this was actually an eco-lodge and he considered us to still be within the natural habitat even while we were sitting there in the air-conditioned room listening to the talks. Oh my, oh my. I, 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 I I, I didn't mean to insult him. I was just asking a question. <laughs> My favorite eco lodge was a place in Costa Rica that said, "What's most important?" and they pointed outside. Yeah. They, they, they weren't trying to compete with nature; they're trying to complement it. But you know, their yeah. eco was was a couple pegs down from the person you're describing. Uh, which which was that lodge, by the way? I'd love to get to Costa Rica again. Well, I'll tell you this, uh, yeah. I just, uh, you know, we have these snapshots of different places, and yeah. I just really wonder how these places kind of mature over time, and they ha they may have their green label or their accreditation, but, you know, to me, they're never asking the right questions, because, uh, you know, my question is always, well, how do these places not only you know do they tick the, you know, the, the cross the T's and dot the I's, but you know how do they get along with the local community? Yeah. And I've seen you know far too many quote unquote eco lodges that have zero relationship with the community, outside of moderately paid better employees. So, you know I think there's a lot of stories that could and should be told, that uh, unfold over time. Um, and that yeah. we're doing a very good job and, of. And actually, at, at, at that same at that same place I was talking about, I won't say which one it was. Um, I was having a drink later, and I asked one. Well, I asked the waiter. I was just wondering what's the public perception nowadays of the word ecotourism. So I asked him what he thought, and he said, "Oh, it means budget tourism. Eco stands for economy." And I thought, now he is working for an award-winning eco lodge. I sort of thought they might tell their employees what eco tourism was. I mean, I was I wasn't expecting everyone to have the same definition, but I was surprised at that definition. Yeah, that's one I really haven't heard of before. Uh, but you know, my take in looking at this across the world is that we do have different perceptions on on these words. And oh, sure. The way that ecotourism, you know, took off, and particularly in Africa, really meant the the upper, uh, the higher end, you know, game lodges. Whereas ecotourism in the Americas meant more of, you know, not a uh, kind of a, a wider range of opportunities, and often with a community involvement. Uh, yeah. Whereas in the United States, you know, we're about to celebrate a hundred years of the. U.S. park system, and uh, you know, without using the word ecotourism, you know, that's the basis of the national parks. You know, Yosemite yeah. was ecotourism, and certainly a lot of you know ups and downs, peaks and valleys, but the model was there before the word. Yeah, and I, I was looking at something from Finland. Sorry. I was looking at something from Finland the other day and the lady talking about wildlife tourism said we don't use the term ecotourism in Finland. Although what she was describing was what most of us would think about as ecotourism. I hear you. And you know there's you know the the constant battle for some of these definitions. You know we also get into the battle right now with 
what is responsible tourism. And February 10th to the 16th, I'm hosting the uh, the annual week-long unconference, uh, Responsible Travel Week. Yeah. yeah. But you know, you, you can't. You know, where it was boiled down in the Cape Town Declaration is that responsible travel is, is simply that a better place to live is a better place to visit. So it really puts that that focus back on the community that if you're not yeah. really, if you're not really benefiting the community or the locals then it really doesn't matter what sort of tour operation you have it simply isn't uh, that effective yeah. and certainly isn't that responsible but yeah. you know the last thing I'll say about this and I want to hear what you think but you know we get so caught up in some of these words and for the for the most part I've never really found an ecotourist or a responsible traveler the last trip I made, my, the last first trip I made to Australia, was back in 2007 when I met you for the first time face to face. And you know what was on my agenda? You know? What was my what was on my agenda? You know, it was uh, speaking at the Aboriginal Tourism Australia conference, but also visiting the parks, also visiting the Shannon Market, and also visiting a, a good rugby match in Brisbane. You know, yeah. the and I and I say that not because I think everyone does that route, but because I think everyone has, you know, a lot of different niche interest. And you know, you you're going to want to go out to a fine place for dinner some night. You're going to want to go eat street food another time. Yeah. You're going to want to visit town. You're going to want to visit the. You know, you're going to want to visit a park. Um, but the way that tourism in Australia and around the world is kind of marketed or promoted. Is that no? We have nature travelers. I don't know yeah. any. You know, I don't know how anyone could be a nature traveler with you, without visiting Brisbane. Yeah, so yeah. Actually, this was pointed out by an economist at our um, at our wildlife tourism workshop a couple of years ago. He said some of the studies say that uh, seventy percent of people in, are nature tourists, but he said they uh, they're described as nature tourists. If during all of their travels they'd visited a zoo or gone on a whale watching trip or gone to a national park, they go down as a nature traveler. He said, now if they asked them again, uh, instead about cultural tourism, they'd have gone down if they'd been to a museum or an Aboriginal culture experience or whatever, um, and maybe they'd come up with 60% of cultural tourists and then, you know, etc. So you get way above a hundred percent if you added up all those categories. So yeah, it's a bit of an artificial category. And it's an, it, it, to me, it's a it, to me it's an uh, it, to me Australia is a rich country in terms of everything that, that it has on offer. I think the country is you know very close uh, to the United States in terms of its adoption of farmers markets. I can't I. Yeah. Uh, it certainly is uh, leading the pack in terms of culinary tourism, and I remember, you know, we had we shared a bottle of wine, and yeah. I remember so many folks in Australia were just so proud of, you know, so proud of their wines and their and their coffee. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, and, and that's what Tourism Australia is mostly promoting at the moment. They're promoting Australia as a fine dining and wining. Although I'm hoping they don't just show the top end, because a lot of the interesting places are the little cottage industries, where you know you can buy some locally made coffee, locally handmade chocolates, um, you know, scones and cream with Australian uh, maybe wattle seed flavourings, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot of these little cottage industries which I hope don't get. Uh, if you know what I mean, do you use the term cottage industry? Meaning, just a small, you know, it might be someone on a farm that develops that, that makes their own blackberry jam or something, um, and uh, sells it at the local markets or some little local cafe that might, um, like there's ones up at the Bunya Mountains that do meals from the Bunya nuts, you know, the Bunya Bunya tree, which is related to the uh, monkey puzzle tree of South America, that the Bunya's related to Australia, uh, native to Australia, one of the Araucarias. Uh, anyway, yeah, I was uh, I, all the, the monkey tree ones. is in Araucaria, correct? It is. The monkey puzzle tree is in Araucaria. But it's a Araucaria, Araucaria. 
Uh, yeah, it was named after the uh, Aracana Indians of South America. I can't wait to play Jeopardy. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it's in, it's in Chile and Argentina. Then there's another one that's in northern Argentina, another Araucaria in northern Argentina and southern Brazil. I've seen that one. I haven't seen the monkey puzzle tree except saw it in Stanley Park in Vancouver. Oh, they're they're all over the world. <laughs> now they are. As I say, there to me, Australia is an incredibly rich country in terms of all of the variety and the depth that it has. Uh, where I have questions, where I think these hangouts can can be of help, is if we can uh, talk about it uh, simply, and if we can hopefully have a few more people the next hangout and figure out how to turn on the Q and A function on the Google Hangout. Um, right. As I, yeah. as I told you. Go ahead. Yeah, something I'd like to know from folk from other parts of the world is what they'd like to see in our national parks when, when they get there. There's a big push in a number of our state governments at the moment to open up our parks to a lot more activities, accommodation within the national parks, which I think is probably a good idea in some of the really big outback national parks, not so much in little national parks. Uh, or forested national parks or anywhere where it would have too much impact on the environment. Um, but, uh, you know, the ones that take you a day to drive through, it might be nice to have a hostel or something in the middle of that. But also opening them up to um, horse riding, mountain bikes, um, zip lines, um, hunting, fishing, all sorts of, in fact, um, shooting is now allowed in a number of, na of the New South Wales national parks. The rangers aren't too happy about that. They don't want to have a pot shot um, flying past their heads sometime when they're just uh, going quietly doing their duties and didn't know a shooter was around. And uh, Families aren't too happy about the idea either. But yeah, there's a number of... Freezing. Um, but there's, there's sort of a feeling that Amongst, uh, amongst some of our policy people paying more to come into them. Now, I'd like to know from travellers from the other parts of the world whether they would be more attracted to uh, walking in national parks and looking at wildlife or whether they really need the horse riding, the um, you know, um, mountain biking and um, all sorts of other activities within the national parks which some of us would prefer to see on private or other land next to the national parks, or if they are going into national parks, I'd like to see monitoring of the vulnerable wildlife species and vulnerable habitats to see what impact some of these new activities might have on them. But yeah, I'd like to get the opinions of some of those from overseas and um, any uh, experiences of folk from other countries that uh, that do have a lot of these activities in their national parks and whether there has been any impact on the wildlife or the habitats or whether it can be controlled properly and how and how do we know what sort of monitoring systems do we need so that we do know and I think that's a that's a I think that's an excellent uh, question that we should be pursuing in these follow-up conversations and and no doubt we'll be kind of you know be discussed at this World Parks Congress. Uh, again, the countries seem to have, you know, just very, very different systems of how they define parks and how they manage parks and how they open up parks to recreation and tourism. Uh, did you ever have a chance to watch the U.S. documentary series uh, by Ken Burns on the national parks? No, I didn't. And this is where I have. Uh, a great dislike for our cross-Pacific divide, that it really is hard to get uh, the good documentaries and movies from Australia and New Zealand on this side of the Pacific, and it's hard wow. for folks to get the, uh, the PBS series over there. Um, right. But again, when you look at how the U.S. parks were created, uh, it it start you know it it basically included everything at the beginning. But they found that 
by attracting more and more visitors and having the visitors basically unmanaged, that the value of the parks was, you know, decreasing steadily. And yeah. it was the idea of protecting the parks and managing the parks that I do think that the United States has some just tremendous lessons to share. Um, mm. It used to be everyone's, you know, right to to drive into the park and to drive to any point in the park. Um, what we see in the past 10 to 20 years is a lot of shared shuttle services from the visitor center in the park. So you know, you park either outside the park or at the visitor center, and then you take the shuttles to the various uh, uh, various hiking points and or scenic scenic vistas. Yeah, yeah I, re I remember shuttle buses in the uh, Yosemite National Park. They were very handy. You'd hear that a bear had been seen somewhere, so hop on a shuttle bus and head out that way to see if you could find it. We never did, but yeah, and to the beginnings of walks and so on. But I think, you know, the, to me the question is, as a visitor, is to understand, all right, well, again, what am I getting, or what are, what should I be expecting? Uh, if I'm, if I am escorted, you know, to the entrance of a national park, and they say, all right, you know, enjoy yourself, but there's nothing to do here, except, you know, you can, you can do your own hiking, but really, I can't, yeah. I, I can't go on a mountain bike there? Uh, yeah. At least I think these things need to be explained. Should be explained uh, ahead of time. Um, yeah. And again, we'll be you know, it's you know, it's January 2014. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of this big event in Australia to kind of get up to speed again on what's happening in Australia. I'm such a big fan of uh, the ABC National Radio, and the little that I do know about parks has you know come by. Come by way of programs like Bush Telegraph or Off Track, and just like listening to what the radio producers are broadcasting, mostly for Australians. I'm the I'm the outlier who listens from abroad. You know, they're 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 a strange listener in Oaxaca, Mexico, or, or now Las Vegas. But we need to compile a list of you know documentary programs or radio shows uh, that really tell us about. Uh, the parks, and starting with Australia, but you know, I'm going to be very interested in hearing about parks around the world. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then we've got our neighbours too, the the national parks of New Zealand, uh, New Guinea. I don't, um, yeah, I know New Guinea has a lot of uh, problems up there for preserving some of the areas, but um, they are trying, and then there's uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. So I mean, when you're down this part of the world, uh, I'll be interested in hearing about the whole world as well. But there's a lot that even Australians don't hear about. We, when we think about going on a wildlife tourism holiday, we tend to think, oh, got to go to Africa. We don't realise, hey, Indonesia's right here. We've got Borneo with orangutans and elephants and proboscis monkeys and all sorts of wonderful creatures. And then Malaysia. I've been to the Tamanagara National Park in Malaysia. That was marvellous. And Kinabalu. But um, now, do you hear about those sorts of national parks in America? We don't hear about them very much here in Australia, unless we really start looking for it. I would say that there's the scattershot approach of documentaries on National Geographic or Discovery, uh, yeah. but not not too much. And, and again, if you if you try to find it again, then you're hard pressed of finding out, finding out about it. Um, you know, yeah. thank you know again, thank you YouTube for, for yeah. the for the videos that are online and for the yeah. and again we're we're seeing a lot of uh, park authorities uh, develop their own YouTube channels, and it's interesting again focusing on Mexico that uh, quite a few of the environmental uh, departments in Mexico have their YouTube channel. Now, it doesn't really address yeah. tourism. Uh, it, it doesn't really uh, provide you the basics of how to get to certain places, but it gives you a, a feel of the challenges and the successes yeah. that the, that Mexico has had when it comes to protecting its truly incredible wildlife and biodiversity. Yeah. Now, what, one national parks. Um, site which I really really like and which I used extensively both times before going to South Africa, 
the South, South Africa National Parks forums. They have forums on all sorts of things. They've got travellers' tales. People uh, write in about um, you know the elephant that chased them or the cheetah that they saw on a particular road or uh, where the best picnic spot is and all that sort of thing. Or then you know there's rangers that will write about some of the conservation issues and um, oh, it, it's a very well used site. It, it seems as though dozens or hundreds of people are using that site really regularly and they've got the forum divided into uh, the various national parks like Kruger National Park was the one I was mostly looking at but they have all the other national parks as well and then within Kruger they have that divided into, into various rest camp areas and then various aspects like the mammals of the park, the birds of the park and yeah, it's a really good site, really well used, and I'd love to see that happening in Australia. Yeah. What's fact, the name? I've of been the... talking to Wildlife Tourism Australia. What's the yeah. name of the South African site? Uh, if you just look up S A N Parks, Park. uh, South Australia, uh, South Africa, South Africa National Parks. I think it comes out as San Parks, S A N Parks, dot something or other and uh, look for forums and it's really well done and the, they've um, really got a lot of enthusiastic people um, regularly contributing and sharing stories and asking questions and you know where's the best place to see the African wild dogs or uh, you know which is the best rest camp to stay at which are the you know what sort of meals can I get <laughs> you know all sorts of things and, there, and there's nothing like that Where's for Australia. This? Not really. And um, I've been talking with the Committee of Wildlife Tourism Australia and our new web ma webmaster, Robin Stark, who I'd like to join in some of these Google Hangouts. Um, and, um, yeah, if the National Parks aren't going to start one, well, I'd like Wildlife Tourism Australia to, to get that going. And, um, yeah, she's enthusiastic, but her... Uh, her other job is private investigator, which is <laughs> very involved in working as at the moment. Now there's a combo you don't hear about frequently. <laughs> well, Rhonda, uh, I want to thank you for for your time, and and uh, I know we had a little bit of a um, mix up at the beginning of this hangout, thanks to my computer freezing the moment I started the broadcast. Um, but I hope we can do this again soon, and we'll figure out uh, yeah. when it works for you and some of your colleagues. And please, uh, for those who are viewing, uh, we would like your questions. We would like your comments. This is being webcast live on YouTube. The video is is archived on YouTube. You're welcome to post a comment. Uh, please provide us some suggestions. Where can we go for more information about parks and protected areas? And we'll update uh, the Planeta Wiki and Planeta.com providing some of our you know, top ten suggestions and uh, to the to the organizers and facilitators of the World Parks Congress we wish you the very best and uh, thank you everybody. Any final comments Rhonda? No, just I'd um, be very uh, yeah I'd be very happy to hear any feedback, any questions, any comments from uh, oh, anyone anywhere in the world that's interested and especially those that are thinking of coming to the Congress but even those that can't make it to the Congress that have a few questions, yeah, or a few comments. And, the, and do it. We can also, and if they want to know some suggestions of some great national parks to visit, well, I've visited quite a few of them. I, I can, uh, I can give a bit of advice. Just to stump you, Rhonda, in the past year, you've had, you've had uh, clients, you've had travelers with Araucaria tours from what countries? Ah, let's see, America. Um, and Canada, UK, Southern Ireland, Germany, Switzerland, Norway, Finland, France, other parts of Europe, South Africa, uh, Israel, Iceland, Tahiti. Oh, some of those go back more than more than the last twelve months. But yeah, from all over Brazil. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, very good to see you. Uh, stay on the line. We'll, we'll wrap this up privately, but uh, we'll end the broadcast here. Thank you okay. for your time. Oh yeah, actually, I forgot the Asian countries just then. We've had them from uh, we've had uh, guests from mainland China, Taiwan, 
Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, thank you.